Some things are real. You know, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Martin Luther King, real. They really, really happened. They really, really did important things. Real. Some things aren't real. They're just fictional. And I got in trouble for the other services, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you this too. There's, there's somebody that's not real. Spider-Man is not real. Neither is Batman. <laughs> They're not real, and we're okay with that. It's not, it's, not, it's not all that necessary. It's not that important. And then there are others that might be real, might not be real, not sure how important it is. King Arthur was there, probably was maybe a real man named had that, but how much of it was true? How much was just made up stuff? Robin Hood, how much is real? How much is not real? Was there really a dude who corresponds to that? If you got a time machine, would it be possible to go back and find him somewhere? And if you did, what would it really change? <clears throat> Of course, that's really, really relevant when you start talking about Christmas and Christmas morning and the, the, the nativity scene and Jesus and Mary and Joseph and shepherds and wise men and stars. And, is it real? And, and for everybody in this room, you have an opinion. You have an, a belief in your head that either, you know, Jesus was a real baby who was the Son of God, and some of you believe he was a real baby, but he wasn't the Son of God. It was just, you know, a good teacher kind of guy. Some of you think it's all made up, that some people were starting this religion in 2,000 years ago, and they sort of wrote this character named Jesus, and they put him into their stories. And a lot of you aren't sure. You think there might be some real and there's some not real and you're not really sure how much it even impacts your life or how much it should impact your life. Now, obviously looking at me, you go, well, this dude's got a vested interest in this whole real thing when it comes to Jesus, right? I mean, you know, it's kind of like what I do. If Jesus isn't real, I'm kind of like unemployed. But I think it would be really cool if we were able to say with some degree of certitude that Jesus is real, that, that Bethlehem was a real town and there really was a manger and there really was a baby placed in that manger and there really was a Mary and there really was a Joseph and there really was angels and shepherds. Now, bef we're going to look at it like a skeptic would look at it today, but before we even get there, there's some things about the whole Christmas story that you've heard that aren't real. I'll tell you that right front. There's some things that you actually thought are part, is part of the story that's not real. Like, um, like uh, what was, was one? Well, like the whole, the, the wise men thing. They like, where we got the number three, I'm not sure. If, if, if we believe what was written in Matthew and, and Luke, they probably didn't show up for at least a year after Jesus was born. And the whole December thing? Yeah, that's not it. Not December. It wouldn't have been. You look at the, if you read the, the text, you can tell that ain't happening in December. You know, some things that we have placed in our nativities aren't real. Like, I don't know, some of you know, th there were no lobsters at the nativity. Zero. Some of you got that and some of you just thought it was weird. And I'm okay with that. Now, sometimes when we're wanting to say, okay, it, from my perspective, we want to say this is real, that they're really, that Jesus is real. Um, one of the things we like to do is we like to go back, and, and, and the Bible's divided into two halves. There's the Old Testament, what, what we could be called the Hebrew Bible, and there's the New Testament. And we like to go back and look in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and find if there's stuff in there that points toward Jesus. So we can say, well, they're real. That, that, it's real because it was predicted. And we like to use one out of, out of a little book called Micah. And Micah says, But you, O Bethlehem of Papharthah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel come out of you, one whose origins are from the distant past. And we can tell that, that the Jewish people believe for a long, long time that Messiah, the one who's going to come restore their kingdom, was going to come from Bethlehem, be born in Bethlehem. And, you know, so when Matthew says he's born in Bethlehem, we go, see, he, he, see, see, and 
the problem is, if you're going to be really skeptical about it, I mean, let's be honestly skeptical, we can just say, yeah, well, sure, Matthew says he was born in Bethlehem, and Luke says he was born in Bethlehem, but th- they're trying to sell their religion. They're starting this new religion. They need you to buy in. And there's this prophecy back in Micah. So how do I know they didn't just write that little piece in? How do I know they didn't just make that up to, to, to sell their faith? Matter of fact, if you're going to be really skeptical, I'm going to actually give you ammunition for skeptics tonight. If you're really skeptical, you can even point into one of the, because there's four books that were written about Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the fourth one in the book of John, there's actually a time when the, the religious people who really didn't like Jesus are questioning who Jesus was. And, and they said, on hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. They're talking about Jesus. He's a prophet. Others said, he's the Messiah, the one who's come to restore everything. Still others ask, how can the Messiah come from Galilee, which is where he grew up? Does not Scripture say the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? So there were plenty of people in Jesus' day who didn't know he was from Bethlehem. They didn't even know it then. So how do I know? Matthew didn't just... That would be cool. Let's include that in the book. How do I know Luke didn't just say, let's be a cool story? He said, well, there's other prophecies, right? Well, well I mean, just, yeah, but so many of them have this same thing what, what, they could have just made it up like you know the one where it says most of you do where it says the virgin will conceive and bear a child in Isaiah and again what keeps Matthew from saying that'll help sell it now I believe Jesus was born in Bethlehem I believe there was a Mary I believe there was a Joseph I believe the angels I believe the star I believe the wise men but to be honest, if you don't, I can't take you to Matthew and say, look, I, here's why I disagree with you that strongly. What would be nice would be if I knew of something that would get past that whole, they just wrote it in to get you to buy their religion thing. It would be really cool if I had something that would get past that problem. And you might guess I think I might, or I wouldn't have brought it up. And it happens on the cross. We're going, to go, we're going to establish a different event. But establishing that event will help us establish the whole Bethlehem thing. And it's the crucifixion. Jesus was, was crucified. And to understand the power in this one little thing, kind of got to remember what a crucifixion was like. I'm not going to make it gross because there are kids here. A crucifixion, they would either tie or nail a person's arms to a crossbar and then tie or nail their feet to the, to the vertical part of the bar. Okay, that was, that's how it was done. And one side effect of being crucified was you hung on whatever was holding your wrists up and you pushed off with your feet. So, so when Jesus, because he was nailed, for him to actually speak was a big deal. If you're hanging on a cross, you're hanging like this, it's really hard. Try it sometime. Try, try to talk while you're hanging like at, in this angle. It's really, really hard to talk. So they rarely said anything. They just hung there silently and suffered. But once in a while, they decide there was something worth saying, and they'd push off against the nails in their feet and pull against the nails on their wrists, and they would say something. And we've recorded Jesus saying seven things. The, the, the gospel writers say seven times he, he thought it was worth saying something. And the seventh one, the last one, he pushed off and he pulled up and he cried out, it is finished. And then it says that he went back down and he gave up the ghost and he died. And we think, most people think, that's really powerful, that's really amazing. But did you know Jesus didn't write that line? That wasn't his. He was quoting something else. Honest. I'll show it to you. Want to see it? It's Psalm 22. And back in Psalms, in tw- Psalm 22 starts out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is exactly what Jesus said on the cross. Right? Matter of fact, let's go back and show him that. About three in the afternoon, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic, a different language, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then, go back to Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, Back to honesty. Couldn't Matthew have just inserted that? 
At this point, yeah. Matthew could have said, this is, this is cool stuff. This will help me sell my religion. This will get you to buy in if you see this really old quote. But it's odd because the question would come to me, because I'm a curious type. Why would he go to that much trouble to quote a psalm? I mean, you only got one more. This is the last sentence you're ever going to utter. If you, if you use it just human, that's the last sentence he's going to utter. What, why, why pick that psalm? Maybe we should look in and see. Let's just, let's just read on down. Okay? Would that be kind of reasonable? That maybe Jesus was saying, why don't you read this instead of just, that, you know, there's more to it than that. So if we move on down. In that same psalm, it's not all that long, just a few verses later, it says, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. And those of you, you know, some of you guys know a lot about Christianity, or you are Christians, and you're going, wait a second, that sounds familiar. It sounds familiar because while he was on the cross, according to Matthew, that thing happened. Okay? And he trusts in the Lord, they say, let the Lord rescue him, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And just go on to the next thing there. He trusts in God, Matthew says. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he he said, I am the son. So they did mock Jesus. They did hurl insults. And they did, in fact, say, if he's from God, why doesn't God rescue him? Just like the psalm. Yeah. So Matthew formed his story of the crucifixion on what he saw in the psalms. So far, maybe. I think it's worth reading some more, don't you? Psalm 22, verse 18 says, They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. You go, wait a second, I remember that too. Just a little bit later, Matthew, after crucifying, they divided his clothes by casting lots. Wow! Matthew really... Matthew, let's be honest. If Matthew is making this up, he should be sued for plagiarism. Because he's just taking this psalm and rewriting it. And I, I, we need to call him an account for this, un- unless, unless there's more going on. So let's, let's keep reading Psalm 22, see if there's anything more. It says in, in the psalm, it says, I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. Now it's, you may not catch it, but now it's getting interesting. Because there's two ways they would crucify people. One was they would, if they, attach, they would either attach him to the cross. The cross would be laid down, the whole thing laid down. They'd lay the person there. They'd nail their hand, hands, wrists, and ankles. And then they'd lift the cross, and they'd drop it into a hole that was deep enough to support it. Now, how tall is the cross going to have to be to hold a, a full-grown man? Yeah, it's, it's got to be six to start, and then you need a little bit of room, so there's about eight feet to start with. But if you're going to have it held up in a hole, anybody ever put a post in a hole? How much do you need on the bottom? You're going to need two, three, four more feet. Two, I wouldn't think about two. I'd say at least three or four more feet, right? So you're going to pick up the cross, and you're going to drop the person into the hole, and they're going to fall three or four feet. Boom. What's going to happen to your joints if you're held that way, and you fall three or four feet? Boom. You're going to be pulled out of joint. The other way they would do it would be they would take the crossbar and they would have it separate and they'd nail the person up and then they'd hoist them by the nails in their hands up to position and what's going to happen to their joints? Huh. Tell you what, this is interesting. My heart is turned to wax. It is melted within me. I won't talk to you about what happens to a heart during crucifixion because it's kind of gross. It's Christmas Eve and we don't need that. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Well, obviously, in crucifixion, that's going to happen. They're going to put you in a pole, stand you in the middle of a field in the bright sun in April, and, it's, and it takes hours to die, hours and hours and hours. That's why they used it. It took hours to die. And so, yeah, they're thirsty. Matter of fact, Jesus said from the cross, remember? He pulled himself up and said, I thirst. Hmm. Interesting. I've been saving the good one. Okay, let's go there. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. I'm saying, yep, Jesus was there. They're all yelling at him. But still, the next line. They pierce my hands and my feet. Can you think of any t- time that we pierce hands and feet? 
When I mean, you think of somebody who's into body modification or really getting tattoos and really getting, where do they not hardly ever pierce? Hands and feet. We don't pierce our hands and feet. Can you think of any way that we torture people using putting holes in people's hands and feet? No, we waterboard. We, we've got methods of torture. They never. They do not involve holes in hands and feet. Now we would be stumped by that, but in Jesus' day, they would go immediately. Ah, yeah, that's a crucifixion. Because crucifixion was really, really popular is not the right word. But it was extremely well known in Jesus' day. Because there had been this guy named Alexander the Great. You've heard of him. Alexander the Great conquered the known world. And one of the ways he did it was he crucified people. He was coming out of Greece... And he's heading down the Mediterranean Sea. You know how the Mediterranean Sea comes over here near Israel with that whole area that's always in trouble? Lebanon, the whole thing. He was coming down. He came to a, a city called Tyre. And Tyre resisted him. He's, he's going to take over the whole world. And this little city decides to give, to give him trouble. They're going to they're they're kick, push back. And they fight him. They work their way out to an island. He has to take ruins and literally build a bridge out to their island so he can capture the city. And when he gets there, pardon my French, he's pissed. He crucifies 2,000 of them. 2,000 is a lot of people, in case you didn't know. On crosses. It made a statement. It freaked out everybody. He finishes up with Tyre. He moves on down the coastline. He comes to Egypt. Now, Egypt in that era was always a power. They were always super powerful. They had a great defensive position lined up because the only way to get there was just a real narrow way to get in. So they could defend themselves against almost anybody. And Alexander the Great, after crucifying 2,000 people from Tyre, comes down, he curls around, gets to Egypt, he gets to the border of Egypt, and Egypt says, come on in. It, it, would you like to be called Pharaoh or would you like king more? Where do you want your capital? Where do you want your throne? What do you want it made of? Whatever you want, you can have because we saw what you did to Tyre when you crucified 2,000 of them. You can do in Egypt anything you darn well please. And when the Romans took over a few generations later from the, from the Greeks, they just said, this stuff works. And they would crucify people regularly just to keep order. Because you can argue whether or, about whether or not certain death penalty things are a deterrent. Crucifixion is a deterrent. Because it is a torture beyond anything most of us can imagine. So, what was the psalmist describing? Crucifixion. In great detail, he described crucifixion. There's a problem. Best historians can tell, crucifixion was invented roughly 500 B.C. in Athens, Greece. I don't know who the idiot was who thought that would be a cool thing to invent, but somebody invented crucifixion around 500 B.C. in Athens. You know when, they, when Psalm 22 was written? Give or take. 1,000 B.C. 1,000 minus 500 when the guy in Athens invented crucifixion, that psalm was already 500 years old. And trust me, nobody in Athens was reading the Jewish book of Psalms. So 500 years before it's invented, the psalmist describes somebody who is very, very important and very, very powerful calling out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me while on a cross dying? And then 500 years after they invent crucifixion, Jesus gets to fulfill it. Now, how does Matthew work that into a document? How does he create that? How does he manipulate the facts so that you'll believe it because he stuck that in there? Any, any ideas? I'm stumped. Can't fake that. You can't fake a thousand years of history. You can't fake this incredibly precise description and a 500-year gap, then the invention of, the, of the, the method, and then 500 years later when Jesus actually fulfills it. You tell me how you invent that, how you create that. Can't, can you? So, for me... I've got a really good reason to think that that whole crucifixion event was real. 
Not, not, not possibly real, not real or not real, doesn't, no, real, not made up, real. I can't picture any way Matthew and Mark and Luke and John make that up. So, if that's real, then by my reckoning, the next event was probably real too. That was when Jesus rose from the dead. And the reason I can think that one's real is because not only does it have all the prophecy behind it, there were like dozens of eyewitnesses. And there were a number of people, dozens more, who died because they said they saw Jesus rise from the dead. They said they saw him afterwards. He saw, we saw him, he talked to us, he sent us out, deny it. No, and they killed him. Dozens. Okay, now, if I've got the crucifixion as real, and I've got the resurrection as real, and the people who describe it most are Matthew and Luke, and they say that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, yeah, I'll say they got that one right. They say Mary was a virgin, I'll give you that one too. It's, it may be hard to believe. It's not as hard to believe as this. So I'm going to say that, yeah, born of a virgin. Yeah, in Bethlehem. Yeah, Mary. Yeah, Joseph. Yeah, angels. Yeah, shepherds. Yeah, wise men. Yeah, star. Real. That's what I'm going to say. And I think, if you've been listening, you may or may not buy into it completely. But there's a reason to think about it, huh? Because by my reckoning, Matthew wasn't selling a religion. He was stating reality. He was saying, this is what I saw. This is what I know. And oh, by the way, there's a faith that sort of accompanies it. But this is my reality. I'm stating it to you. Now, here's the next question. So what? It's 2,000 years ago. What's it matter? Now, at this point, I could go all preachery on you and start saying things very loudly. I, I can do that. And try to convince you by passion to accept what I'm telling you. I don't feel like doing that tonight. Matter of fact, I'm not even going to push you to, to fully commit to it. I'm not, I'm not going to say, man, you should just accept everything. I, no. I, I, Christianity is a reasonable faith. I allow you to take as much time to, to come to grips with what we're saying as, as it takes you. But can I make a couple suggestions, maybe three? What time we've got left? Three things that, if I, may, if I might be right... If it's possible that I'm right, three things that might tweak in your life moving forward. They're real simple things, nothing spectacular. But the first one simply, live like there's more. Live like there's more. Life gets hectic. Everybody notice that? It gets kind of crazy and weird. And after a while, we get to where the only thing we see is the horizontal, the, the physical stuff. Pay the mortgage, work your job, take care of the kids, that stuff. And it, it becomes 100% of your life. But if Jesus really died on a cross, and, and, and if as we believe as followers of Christ that he died to take away the shame and the sin that all of us have committed so we could have a relationship with God. If, if that's true, then there's definitely more. And even if not, if there's just a God, there's more. Because if there's no God, can we be really honest about this? We're trying to be really honest tonight. If there really is a God, there is no more to life. We are all simply accidents in the swirling winds of a universe that means nothing. That's all you are, a blink. That's all any of us are. And so there's no reason except to, I was talking to a guy after the, our first of our services, and he was saying that he didn't believe in God. He was very honest about it. And when, he said, and you're right about that. There is no meaning, there is no purpose, there's no reason to be here. Um, 
I don't think I'm, since nobody knows who it was, he's attempted suicide three times. I'm not encouraging that. But I'm telling you there's more. And that a lot of times if you spend your life, you may have spent 2018 without the more, without the vertical, purely horizontal life. And, and I, bet, I bet it was kind of an empty year for you. But there is more. And I'd encourage you and challenge you in 2019 to consider the more. One other piece. If there's more, you can also live like your life matters. Live like your life has meaning. Because again, if we're all just accidents of the universe... If this is just physical law swirling and everything that you see is just stuff bumping into each other, there is no meaning in life. There's there's no purpose. But if there is a horizontal, if there is a vertical as well, if if Jesus really is who we claim he was and who he claimed he was, then life can have meaning and your life can matter. Matter of fact, Jesus himself said, he said, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. See, Jesus didn't come so you could have the meaningless snap out of existence. He came so you'd have life and abundantly. So you can start living that way. Even if, you, even if you're not really convinced yet about Jesus, you can start living like your life matters because, frankly, you're doing it already. But maybe a little more confidence now. And then finally, I challenge you to live like you can make a difference. Like, you can actually have an impact. How how did Paul say it? Paul said it. We are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We can have an impact. Now, here's, here's the problem. I can tell myself I can have an impact. I can tell myself I can make a difference. I can tell myself I can live like life matters. But the reality is, my, how much I matter doesn't feel like much. Does that ever feel that way for you? You're, you're going through life and you're saying, I think I can make a difference, but I don't know how much. Because here's me, and here's my impact. And I look around and there's a whole heck of a lot more darkness than there is light. And I'm going, as the darkness increases, it can get almost discouraging. Because I just got this. And you keep telling me there's a God, but frankly, I don't know how even God could use a, a candle. Just one. But what if, what if instead of just my light, I decide to do something about that. I decide to act as if somebody else, I could impact somebody else. I find a person, just one, and I use what I have, what talent I have, what ability I have to impact one life. And somehow in that process of saying I can make a difference, I get that person to impact another life. Or maybe two or three, or four. Now, spoiler alert, we're going to light all the candles in the room. You know know what? It's still going to be kind of dark in here. It's it's, it's not going to get bright and glaring. Your your, your glasses aren't going to tint from the candles. But we can show something different show something better we can show some people that are living in hopelessness that there's hope or as the Bible says those who live in darkness have seen a great light and in our case the great light isn't one of us the great light is all of us
Now, I said I wasn't going to try to convince you necessarily to just decide to follow Christ tonight, but it's still possible. Somebody, God worked and you're ready. If you'd like to talk to somebody about having a relationship with God through Christ tonight, when we're done, we've got all the lights blown out and that light, big lights are on. There'll be some blue bags. There'll be some over here on the corners, the platform, some in the back on the tables. And if you grab one of those, that just tells us you'd like to talk about having a relationship with God. And if, if you pick one up, no pressure, but somebody will come to you who's been trained. They'll take about 10 minutes. They'll walk you through the contents of the bag and show you how to have a relationship with Christ. Now, I also know that some of you might not be ready for that. You've got a simple thing to do. Keep asking questions. Keep being curious. And come back. We do the same basic thing without the candles every week. <laughs> Except next week. And just, just come back. Keep asking your questions. You're welcome here. Whatever questions you got, God's bigger than your questions. And he may just answer a few of them. Also, um, we're not in a big hurry. I'm going to actually let you out on time tonight. And after the, the lights come on, and there's a, there's a cross over in the corner, and if you'd like to pray about something, anything, it's just a safe place to just talk to God. You take somebody with you, go by yourself, whatever. Also, if you'd like to take communion to kind of remind yourself of all Christ did for you, there's a communion station here, one in the front, one in the back. Just meander. You can talk to somebody. You can say hi. We do have one favor. This is the last service. And when we built this gym, we decided we didn't want to just make it a church. We make it a gym, which means there are kids coming to play basketball and there are karate lessons and there's all kinds of stuff happening in a week. And if you guys could do us a huge favor and just stack a couple chairs or take a couple folding chairs and hang them in the back rack on your way out, that would be such a wonderful favor for us. We'd really appreciate it. But whether you feel like doing that or not, Have a Merry Christmas. God loves you.